on this event with Dr. Christopher S. Reyna. This event is sponsored by the International Human Humanistic Management Association Centers Consortium. The International Humanistic Management Association is concerned with the protection and dignity, uh, protection and promotion of dignity and well-being and human flourishing. And the EMA Centers Consortium brings together global, diverse, and mission-driven business school centers around the globe to advance dignity-based management scholarship and practices by focusing on three primary areas. The first, teaching excellence, pedagogical excellence. The second, global visi visibility and outreach. And then the third, primarily research innovation around humanistic management practices and principles. And today's event is part of our mindfulness initiative within the Centers Consortium Research Cluster. And so with that said, I want to thank Dr. Reyna for being with us today. And I'd like to introduce him um, to everyone briefly. Dr. Reyna is an assistant professor in the Department of Management and Entrepreneurship at Virginia Commonwealth University and the founder and president of Leading Without Ego. He consults and leads trainings on mindfulness and mindful leadership and managing the emotional space within organizations. His research focus is on the intersection of leadership, mindfulness, and emotions in the workplace and how these things bring about employee and organizational well-being. He received his PhD in Business Administration from the W.P. Carey School of Business at Arizona State University, which is also my alma mater, so I'm very happy to have another alumni here. And today we will have a conversation about the effects of mindfulness on relationships and workplace practices. So with that said, um, I should introduce myself too. My name is Dr. Sophia Town. I am also an ASU uh, graduate and I'm with Fordham University um, with Michael Pearson as well. And Chris is a, 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 a colleague, a friend and a fellow mindfulness scholar. And I just cannot wait to interview you today and hear what you have to say about mindfulness research, research and then how mindfulness affects workplace practices and relationships which is so relevant, I think, particularly right now when our workplace is shifting and mindfulness has become um, not only more of an interest, it seems, but a necessity, I think, for a lot of us. So thank you so, so much for being here today. Thank you. So the way that this will go, I'm gonna start with a few questions um, and I'd invite you also to uh, add your questions to the chat. So Michael Pearson will be facilitating the chat if you have a question, just type it directly there and then we'll, we'll bring up those questions along the way so we'll have an interactive discussion. Okay, and everyone knows where the chat is and how to use that function? Okay, fantastic. All right, on that note, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Okay, so Dr. Reyna, I want to start out by, by asking you kind of what your definition is of mindfulness. There are so many definitions floating around today in scholarship and in the workplace, and there can be some confusion about what mindfulness means. So in your work, how do you define mindfulness? That's a good foundational and, and good question to start with. And, and just wanted to extend uh, also my thanks to, to you and, and Michael for having me uh, on this. Uh, and then I'm eager to, to hear the thoughts. I just want to echo what you said. Please put your thoughts and ideas into that chat box. I think it's much more interesting when it's dynamic uh, and engaging rather than me doing all the speaking. Um, and to get to the, uh, the question that you asked, you know, there are a lot of definitions of mindfulness out there, and I think there's quite a bit of confusion. And I think that's not uh, unnormal for a, a newer construct. Of course, mindfulness isn't new, but perhaps the way we talk about it in business uh, and the Western sort of world is perhaps a bit more new. Um, and, and I speak somewhat like a, like a leadership coach and consultant. And, and so I like to make things really, really easy. And so I think the best way to think about mindfulness is simply intentional attention. So recognizing that how we pay attention and what we pay attention to matters a lot. So in every successive moment that we go through at work and in our home lives, you know, can we be better at understanding who and what is getting our attention? And then what is the quality of our attention that we're paying to those 
objects or to those people. Um, so to me, that's the basic idea. And, and I think the nice thing about that is when we start to consider mindfulness and, and sort of the longer definition, uh, there, there's a lot of words in it and, and people sort of lose what it means. They can shake their head and say, yeah, that, that makes sense. I know what the words mean. But when you put that together, I don't know how to do it. And I don't mm -hmm. know how it informs my work day or how I show up with my uh, husband or, or spouse or, or, or wife at home. I don't get what to do with it. And I think intentional attention sort of helps people say, that's what mindfulness is. That's what I can do. That's how I can get better at it. I can be better with my attention. I can be more intentional with my attention. It seems so simple, but such a small thing could be so powerful that we see in research. I agree. And, and, um, you know, Sophia, we had uh, mentioned, do we want to start with a, a mindful moment of sorts uh, to get sort of people sort of in that in that space? Yeah, I think we can do that. So I'll keep it brief because um, sometimes I can get lost in these in these centering practices. But um, what I invite everybody to do very quickly here is briefly here is just find a comfortable position. And I'm going to talk you real quick through a centering practice. And the cool thing about mindfulness is it doesn't have to be very long. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. So just sitting in your chair with your feet flat on the ground in front of you, shoulder width apart or ankles touching, sitting in a, um, a prideful posture, but not too firm and not too um, tight, just kind of loosely sitting comfortably, palms in your lap, palms down or palms up, whatever's most comfortable. And then what I'm gonna ask you to do with your eyes softly closed is take a couple of big breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. And when you do this, counting to four on the in breath. So breathing in, two, three, four, pause, two, three, four, and out through the mouth, two, three, four. Pause, two, three, four. Just doing that on your own now for two more full counts. Once more together, in, two, three, four, pause, two, three, four, and exhale, two, three, four. Now breathing at your own pace, bringing some awareness to your fingers and your toes, maybe giving your neck a little stretch. And when you're ready, gently open your eyes. Thank you, Sophia. I think that's just perfect timing and reinforces the, the message that, that we just talked about, right? That's how we pay attention in an intentional way. So as you mentioned so well, it doesn't have to be a long time. And, and sort of what you led us through was more of a formal practice. It was oriented toward the breath. But at the very basic level, what we were doing was intentionally paying attention to the way we're breathing. Uh, and, and if we want to extend that into what I sort of call the informal practice, that's uh, extending that intentional attention to how we show up at work or how we conduct a meeting or how we listen to another individual. Again, that's paying attention in a intentional way, just like you did in that brief exercise uh, at the beginning. So thanks for making it real for us there. Yes, of course, of course. So that, what you just said, I'm curious about that. So you're talking about mindfulness showing up in meetings or just how we're interacting. And in your research, you explore the emotional space within organizations. So can you describe a little bit what this emotional space looks like, maybe what it feels like, and how mindfulness um, informs all of this? Do all organizations have this emotional space? Sure, I, I think they do. And um, answering this, I'll, I'll probably take a, a strange way of answering it, perhaps, but I think it goes back to basic 
chemistry. I wasn't actually very good at chemistry in, in high school, but uh, I liked the concepts. And, and one concept that's always stuck with me, it's this idea of, you know, atoms. We have positive, negative, and neutral at the very basic sense. And organizations, I think, are also charged in that way. And if we think of every interaction almost as, you know, an opportunity for atoms to fuse together and, and, and become something different, you know, there's this opportunity for something to be more positive or neutral or more negative. And I think at the very most basic sense, I mean, how do we ensure and I believe we can ensure through mindfulness that when we interact with people and when we connect with people at work, we can leave them better than we found them. So it's at least neutral or if not in a more positive state. And we really want to guard against leaving them in sort of a more negative state. And I think the power here is that our actions and our words and our thoughts and our emotions carry weight and they impact other people. And, mm -hmm. um, when we're aware of that, I think we realize that it's our duty and, and, and it's hopeful that we're always moving toward more mindfulness because, you know, what we say and do and what we don't say and don't do is sending messages to people and people interpret those. Uh, and when they interpret those in, in a way that maybe we didn't mean it or maybe our tone was such that uh, it it diminished uh, their self-esteem or made them feel less engaged, that has a real impact on how they do work. Uh, and so the mindful leaders is, is, I think, readily able to access throughout the day that knowledge that there's sort of three ways we can leave the organization or leave the interaction and ensure that it's at least neutral and ideally more positive. Excellent. Okay. So I, th I, saw, I thought I saw something, some questions coming into the chat. Michael, are there any questions that would be uh, good to pose at this particular point? I think that there are questions coming in and uh, maybe Indrani Kamarkar, are you able to unmute and ask your question? Yes, uh, I was thinking that uh, we did this a very little session here and I was wondering that when you work with organizations, uh, how do you actually uh, conduct the sessions? Is it, uh, uh, are they kind of uh, training sessions with leaders or is it a daily exercise? Uh, I'm not sure how it goes with the organizations and I'm interested to know about that. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think with um, you know, at the basis of my research is sort of leadership and it's, it's all about how do we influence and impact others. And, and I believe through mindfulness, we're better able to step back and recognize what our audience needs and mm -hmm. what the people we're leading need. And to your point, you know, there's a lot of organizations and a lot of leaders who aren't ready, uh, whatever ready means to them for the word mindfulness or even you know they, they can't really bring that in or are not interested in bringing that into to how they lead and so i think there's a very careful way in which um, i connect with leaders about mindfulness and, and going in too too early and too heavy with um kind of a lot of the details about mindfulness uh, even present moment awareness without judgment which is the basic definition of mindfulness can be a difficult definition for organizational leaders to really understand. And so, you know, I really start about talking about attention and, and I make it simple. And I say, you know, if attention is like your favorite dessert, you know, you, you want to guard who gets a piece of your favorite dessert. And so thinking about who and what, you know, you're allocating your attention toward matters, just like, you know, who gets a slice of your favorite dessert matters at your uh, celebration party. And so I think analogies like that and, and helping folks recognize that at the basis, the basic aspect of mindfulness, it's about attentional allocation. Uh, I've yet to encounter any leaders who say they don't want to be better at managing their attention. And so I think then from, from that point, we manage to bring in more of the fundamental aspects of mindfulness. And I absolutely lead them in an exercise similar to what Sophia led us in, but I don't start right away with that because it may make people's eyes and ears close. 
Uh, but then I take us through a mindful exercise similar to what Sophia did, but I would add uh, to the one that I do, I sort of add a, a physical component like she did at the end with, with the fingers. Uh, and then I would think about the breath and I'd also bring in aspects of the environment as far as auditory stimuli. And then simply after that exercise, we can debrief it and say, you know, what you did in that exercise was intentionally pay attention to three things. You know, the space in the room, the emotional space, if you will, in which we can hear what's going on and machines and we can hear sort of that space and then we can hear inside our own body, which is the breath and maybe the heartbeat. And we can also feel sort of outside of our body, which is our fingers, maybe the weight of our feet on the floor. And guess what? All three of those things are happening right now, but you didn't think about them until I asked you to think about them. So at every moment we have an infinite choice of who and what we pay attention to. Mindfulness allows us to more intentionally choose what we pay attention to. So I hope I answered your, your question. I think it's, it's knowing your audience and knowing where they're at and speaking in terms about mindfulness in ways that they're open to hearing and learning. And yes, it absolutely involves practice, but I believe it has to be the right practice in the right way at the right time for the audience. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because um, what you mentioned about leaders and being a little bit, uh, having to be um, thoughtful and intentional actually about how you teach this. Once people hear about it, oftentimes they think and learn about it more. Oh, this is a superpower. You know, who doesn't want to be more intentional like you mentioned? And so getting that, to, you know, getting them around that idea is I think a really powerful thing. I want to go back to your research a little bit. Um, you and I are similar in that we, kind of straddle the academic and then the, the practical. And those, these things are often so infused and really inform and advance one another. Um, but when you think about just your research, research specifically, what is the most exciting finding that you've landed on to date around this topic? You know, personally, or just from what I've read or, or both, I guess? Uh, personally, yeah. What is your most, anything in your research that surprised you or, um, excited you about about mindfulness or emo the emotional space within organizations anything in that realm a couple a couple things come to mind um, one that I actually set off in my dissertation to to really capture and that's the 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 challenge of measuring mindfulness I mean it may not be surprising especially how we've defined mindfulness how do we sort of get in the head of the person and understand you know how much attention they're paying in a given moment is a challenge and are they even able to recognize uh, whether they are or are not is a challenge um, but I guess what I'm getting at with this is how do we measure mindfulness and what comprises it I mean is there multiple dimensions of it there's a huge debate in the scholarly literature, whether it's unidimensional, which tends to be the way that we measure it most often with the Brown and Bryan 2003 scale. Uh, there's also a plethora of multidimensional scales of which I have one that I uh, created as well. And it's, it's a little bit messy on how to capture mindfulness. Um, my most recent work is really honing in on a two-dimensional conceptualization of mindfulness. One is very much about the attention and one is about that ability to be aware of self and that ability to step back and, and recognize that the thoughts and emotions you have are simply thoughts and emotions. And therein lies the power to change them. If we can become aware of them, we can change the way that they unfold. And so I'm calling that uh, you know, uh, mindful metacognition and mindful attention. And so I'm eager to see uh, if if the the field continues to to put research energy into those two components and and, and further helps us understand um, how to how to measure it. An another few things that I've come across is this idea that what we believe matters so much, mm -hmm. and uh, this is 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 talking about a recent uh, paper in OBHDP. And we're looking at, in that study, the antecedents or the predictors of mindfulness. So much research has, has used mindfulness as the predictor of other uh, you know, mediators and dependent variables. But what predicts mindfulness? And, and I think the neat thing about this paper 
is that we say, you know, it's not so much about the person bringing mindfulness. There is components of the environment and the context that act upon the person to help them become more mindful or perhaps take them away from feeling mindful. And we can't ignore that. And one of the biggest predictors that we found, and, and it's pretty pretty compelling, and it actually hurts my uh, dessert analogy a little bit, but this idea that maybe our attention isn't as finite as we thought, and our beliefs about our attention actually can change how we, how many resources we have to allocate. It's this idea of expanding that pie. So our dessert pie is getting bigger mm. if we believe that we can sustain our attention if we believe that our attention can't be sustained over time and that it's more finite then mm. we use it up faster and so there's this belief component that's really powerful in predicting whether someone is mindful or is not and so we call that uh, metacognitive beliefs in mindfulness um, and so that's a, a pretty intriguing and, and really neat finding that, that's relatively recent that, that I'm really excited to explore more. What's really interesting about that is oftentimes when we talk about mindfulness, often, you know, we're thinking about research coming out of the psychology discipline and the nursing fields and medical fields. We tend to measure mindfulness as a trait, like a fixed thing or as even a state, but it's something um, that someone kind of has. And um, what you're talking about here is inspiring because this idea of belief is probably malleable. It's probably teachable. People aren't immutable. And so being able to get people um, sort of galvanized around that and, and change the way that they perceive themselves sounds like it has a lot of larger impact. Yeah, you, you hit it exactly on the head, right? Beliefs, we can, we can change. And I mean, I think the next step, as you're suggesting, really, is to look at, you know, is, you know, an MBSR class or a mindfulness-based stress reduction training class, I mean, what is it, what is it changing from pre to post? It may be really changing the beliefs one has about how they can pay attention, and that may be driving a lot of the benefits of that training. So that's an, an open question, but I think yeah. that is absolutely uh, very possible. Great. Michael, how's the chat looking? Any questions in the chat that would be a good fit right now? Uh, lots of questions, lots of questions. Keep them coming and I hope we can get to many. But I wanted to start with uh, Jenny Robinson and it, it doesn't quite tie into this current thing, but it may be a resolution. So maybe, uh, Jenny, can you unmute yourself? Hi, I can unmute myself. Hi, Jenny. Hi. Can you ask your question? <laughs> so I think I, I've seen a couple of people um, who clearly have uh, some scholarly interest in mindfulness and um, understand that there's a, a basic Buddhist psychology underpinning mindfulness. That's the root of um, the Western conceptualization. But in um, simplifying our conceptualization to the Western view, we're in danger of losing some of the, the wonderful nuances that sit in the original Eastern view. And one of them is around uh, non-judging, non-fixing and acceptance. And given that the corporate world is all about judging and fixing, I wondered how you brought those into the conversation. Yeah, it's a brilliant, brilliant question. And one of the most frequently asked question because on the very basic level you're right when mindfulness and we talk about it as non-judgmental present moment awareness how can how can a conceptualization or a construct you know fit into the judgmental aspect of the world and of specifically of business which is about inherently judging and making uh decisions and and it's a it's a very challenging question um, this, this goes back a bit to what I was saying about that dual component nature of mindfulness that's emerging. Uh, I do believe that metacognitive mindfulness or that uh, mindful metacognition, that's that really stepping back and, and recognizing the bias that we have and the baggage that we bring and recognizing that, that so much of what we do and see and say and experience is filtered through our own biased lens and that's part of the human condition 
I think if we bring awareness to that and we become over time more metacognitively aware of that filtering process, uh, we can become, as Eckhart Tolle says, sort of more aware of that voice in the head. Uh, and that being more aware of the voice in the head, I think strips away some of uh, those judgments that we make such that we can move forward in our work lives and home lives with less of that that bias and less of that judgment. So to your really important point, we can't and shouldn't lose that aspect of mindfulness. And I think if we lean too much into the definition of mindfulness as that attention, we, we risk that. And that's why that metacognitive piece is so important. That's that stepping back uh, and, and recognizing and pausing uh, and, and bringing other ideas and thoughts into the decision-making process and questioning assumptions uh, and then moving forward when the decision uh, has as much information as possible, we move forward in making that decision, but it's not a decision that's not intentional. Does that answer the, the question a bit? Yes, I think that's really interesting. Thank you very much. Sure. That sort of segues into another question that I have here about how does resilience play into, mind, into mindfulness, leadership, and emotions? Well, I think at the at sort of the basic level there, my, resilience is about how we, how we bounce back from challenging times, how we manage emotions. And if you're, you're doing both of those components of, of mindfulness, you're sort of stepping back and recognizing that what you're experiencing now is what it is and uh, tomorrow we don't know what that'll bring and so it centers you in go ahead no i said that's so true especially right now <laughs> yeah it centers us and and i think that that very much helps with with that resiliency uh, and it helps us um you know this idea of equanimity is that we 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 experience life it's not that we become closed off but we experience things within within sort of a uh it's not huge swings up and huge swings down right mm -hmm. there's not that those huge inflection points it's putting things more into perspective and i think when we're able to do that it leads uh, very importantly to higher levels of resiliency and recognizing that you know even in in the challenges that we're experiencing now among covid-19 Right. What, what really gets us most stressed is if we think back to how life used to be, probably, and how we and how we want work and our lives to return. And that's very much a past oriented cognition and emotional state. Or maybe it's looking to the future of, of when things will open back up and when things will return. But in both of those cases, you know, we're really grasping for something we can't control in most cases in the present moment the moment we're in now, that's what we can control. And, and, and that's really where I think resilience is, is built because we don't get ahead of ourselves and we don't wish things to be different than they are. Uh, and that builds that reservoir of capacity to work through challenging issues. So thank you. And, and building from that question, do you think companies and managers will need to change their leadership style um, in the face of this COVID-19 health crisis? I do. And, you know, currently I'm, I'm working in, in the academic world and it's been at least a, a VCU really refreshing and really neat to see just how much uh, everyone is flexing and, and being resilient on, on how assignments are turned in or how teaching is conducted. Um, and I think, you know, to the extent that organizations are doing that as well with the many pressures on, on parents who are uh, figuring out how to, you know, teach their children at home and then pets and, and, and multiple people working in the same home space that they otherwise weren't, right? There's a lot of challenge going on right now, not to mention the financial stress and, and issues of security. And then, of course, the health related ones that, that so many folks are experiencing with, with worry and, and potentially being sick. Um, and so what I see and hope is that we continue to um, recognize that our experience is our experience and 
everyone else's experience is completely different. And so through that metacognition, we can step back and recognize that, you know, there's a lot out there that people are experiencing that we're not. And I think just that recognition and that mindful attention about that can help us think through some more flexible practices, or mm. maybe it's giving people new ways to work or accomplish work or call in to work, whatever the, the, the case may be. It's, it's, it's a perfect time right now in transition moments to rethink how to accomplish tasks. Mm and work. And, and um, I wrote a blog post about this the other day because people are looking for some, some hope about like, how do I make sense of my new work environment? And one of the things I said in the blog was to remember what's most important to you. It's sort of that idea of, of filling the, the jar with the biggest rocks first and remember what those values are. And, and those values have not changed. Those values are absolutely the same how we accomplish or reinforce those values perhaps has changed. And so go back to a, a focus on those values. And then in this time of transition, think about new ways to reinforce those values. So if you value your family, right, it's going to have to be a, a bit, a different way of evaluating or to, uh, to be with the family, but you got to think about how to reinforce uh, that value. And I think organizations to get, you know, directly to your question, organizations can go back to what they value as well and let go of some of the how to ideas that they've always had about how to get that work done. So it's less about how to do it, more about reinforcing those underlying values that have not likely changed. Uh, and then it feels a lot less painful to let those practices and procedures go because the new practices and procedures are still mm. all about serving those underlying values. That's, that's beautiful. So it's almost like this could be a, an opportunity for creating something um, more in alignment than, than before. Cause we know that past practices and, and, um, can, and protocols can kind of get just residually drug along, drug forward, um, even if they don't necessarily align as well as they once did. So this might be an opportunity to reimagine some of that. Absolutely. Michael, how's the chat look? It's plenty. It's full of questions. I think I'm trying to categorize some pertain to the conceptual foundations in connection with the Buddhist uh, roots, others to the practice in, con uh, in organizations. And uh, then furthers are uh, sort of like in terms of research. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the questions that also ties into the former question by Jenny might, uh, might fit right now. Uh, if Linda Cantor, if you're on and can, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Linda? Hi. Hi, Linda. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, now, my question is really regarding, um, you know, I, I guess I have a concern about um, the depth of mindfulness practice being lost in organizations and um, it being just kind of reported as attentional training and missing the kind of deeper roots of compassion and embodiment and the kind of uh, deeper intentionality of these practices, which really are ultimately about dealing with greed and the hatred and delusion in, in, as part of our mind states. And I was just wondering about your thoughts around that. Sure, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. And you know, I think just as um, I mentioned to an earlier question, um, I try to be as mindful as possible when introducing mindfulness. I think the introduction that, that I've shared is really helpful for, for the beginning. Um, but then it really uh, is about the hard work that, that people put into the practice. And I, everyone wants the, the very quick fix. And, uh, you know, corporate world is, is no different. And, and they want that probably more than anyone is that quick fix. How do I become mindful now? How do I allocate my attention more intentionally now? Uh, and, and then there's a lot of, you know, discussion and a lot of training and a lot of conversation and discernment that then unfolds after 
sort of the initial introduction, uh, they get excited and then they sort of have to go to the hard work of making it happen. Uh, and it's spending time re uh, understanding their underlying values. And usually when you uh, push people and you give them the right psychologically safe environment to do this hard work and you give them a structure, um, you know, they can go pretty deep. I've always been surprised. You know, a lot of organizations want me to come in for, you know, a couple hours and then just do like a lunch and learn about mindfulness. And to your point, it's, it's really challenging to do that. And I really don't like to do that because it's not a one fix. This, this can be introduced, but then I tell them, you know, it's gotta be a follow up in a couple weeks and in three weeks, we gotta, we gotta get them uh, knowledgeable about what this is. And I believe this is something, this is a seed that we plant. And over time when they're, you know, having a discussion with a loved one or, you know, they, they drive home and they're so excited to see their partner at home. And then the first thing that comes out of their mouth is less than sensitive. Uh, and they have that realization, oh, that's what he was saying. That's when I have a choice. That's when my emotions and my cognitions get in the way of me actually putting into effect my value system. And my value system is that I love and care for my partner. And yet I say and do things that hurt that relationship. And so we need that sort of incubation time between introduction to going even on a deeper level to, to work through some of those themes, absolutely about compassion and about how most of everything we do and say and don't do and don't say is, is coming from that place of self. And, and the mindful uh, way of viewing that is to, over time, reduce that presence of, of self and to increase that sense of connection and mm -hmm. interconnection. Uh, and that's why my, my consultancy is called Leading Without Ego. Um, I mean, as Eckhart Tolle and others have talked about, I mean, ego is that sum total of who we are and what we do. Uh, and if we can continually seek to shed the light on that, it shrinks and it becomes smaller. And that leads so much more space for that interconnection and that compassion and viewing the world, not from our perspective, but uh, understanding that, that our actions are interconnected. And, and so I think that it's a very intentional way that, that I take folks across that journey. And I, I thank you so much for the question because it would absolutely be incomplete if it were just about attention uh, to, to your point. Thanks for that question. There are a number of other questions uh, that, that I'll try to summarize uh, because they sort of question the individualistic framing of mindfulness and have to do with how it would work and how you would see it work in relations <laughs> groups organizations especially i think with the question of either spiritual intelligence or social responsibility pos positive social impact etc so that's that's summarizing a number of, of questions here how do you make sense of that yeah i mean um, there's a lot. There's a lot there, and I don't envy your position of having to to, to aggregate them on the spot. Thank you for <laughs> for doing that. Um, I mean, I think if I look forward to what mindfulness research will will do in the next uh, you know few years, I think we have a lot of work to do on the measurement side, and we have a lot of work to do on the integration of levels of analysis side. So I think that's getting to your your you know aggregation of comments around, you know, is it an individual level thing that happens in between someone's ears? Uh, and I think at the, at the very basic level, yes, it's, it's what happens within an individual. Uh, but my interests are really, especially because of my leadership background, it's really taking that intrapersonal phenomenon of mindfulness and understanding how it manifests within a dyadic relationship between two people uh, and ultimately into teams and then organizations. And there's a very distinct organizational mindfulness literature uh, that really kind of comes out of the tradition of mindful organizing and has tended to um, study organizations that, that can have no mistakes made. We think of nuclear power plants and we think of cockpits and airplanes. 
it, quite literally, when a mistake is made, lives are lost and potential damage is done. And so in that way, mindfulness at that organizational level has become uh, a bit synonymous with, with air-free work. And I think that's another interesting conceptualization, but I think there's lots of ways to integrate the bottom-up individual and dyadic mindfulness with that more top-down organizational mindfulness. And I think the two can inform each other uh, quite a bit. So I see that being uh, a lot of work that is yet to be done in the next five or so years with mindfulness. So I think that sort of summarizes the, the levels of analysis aspect of, of your question. I think the other part relates to the ethicality of it. Uh, and it's just being aware and error free may not really, <laughs> may be better in terms of traditional organizational outcomes that may be unethical, right? And so there is this mindfulness criticism and all of these kind of ideas in terms of how much are you actually using mindfulness and take it out of the original normative context? What do you see and how do you see that being in, in, in your current work with companies? I think that's part of the question that is being asked. Yeah, it, um, um, I want to mindfully say this. So the, the, the conceptualization of, of mindfulness at the organizational level uh, is one that that I respect and, and I recognize that there's been a lot of work done there. I think where I'm most excited is is to take those, I, I want to apply mindfulness at the organizational level outside of the context of air-free environments, i.e. the typical organization. And mm -hmm. I think that will require some reconceptualization and integration across the approaches. Uh, we actually have a, a a paper right now that I'm pretty pretty darn excited about in which we we do that. It's it's multiple studies across multiple industries and types of organizations showing how the individual level of mindfulness becomes infused into team and organizational levels, and then how that infusion also goes from the higher level, like the organization, to the lower level. And we specifically look at it uh, in context other than those contexts that need those error-free aspects because I would agree with with some of those uh, criticisms and, and it's not just about not making errors uh, it's about you know doing things with compassion it's about understanding there's a larger whole out there that we need to include so um, I think I think that's a great question and a great point I'd like to ask another research question when we're talking about um, levels of analysis and conceptualizations so you shared with me before that you, you practice mixed methods. Um, as mindfulness research, as we know, originated mostly from the psych and nursing and health sciences, it tends to be highly quantitative. What do you feel is the benefit or what are you gleaning from a qualitative approach to the study of mindfulness? Well, besides the just sort of the, the larger fact that I think mixed methods are just inherently interesting and they they draw on the diversity of perspectives that we have out there i mean i love i wasn't trained uh, as much in the qualitative methods but i've recently gotten into some more uh, qualitative uh, methodology and it's it's so fascinating because you get to capture the mindfulness story as it mm -hmm. unfolds in such a rich way that that the quantitative methods aren't able to to do um, i mostly measure mindfulness at the state level as you alluded to which means you know multiple times per day over two work weeks so we take a within person experience sampling methodology approach so it's still quantitative but i view, I, I view it as a better alternative to to maybe just capturing mindfulness at one point in time uh, but to your to your question qualitative is is incredibly powerful in telling that story and, and the story that we're, we're telling right now in a, in a paper that uh, is, is seeming to, to get some good traction is this idea of, of contagion or spread. Mm. Um, you know, we know what, well, kind of a bad example right now with COVID, but we know how contagiousness works, right? When you think of viruses and, and bacteria, but we also are starting to understand, you know, through neuroscience, how emotions and how ideas can become contagious between people, but we have a long ways to go to unlock that. And I think part of the power of the qualitative paradigm is to uh, 
understand better that transfer of mindfulness. So that's, uh, as Michael uh, asked in that last question, you know, that's a, a really interesting research uh, topic for me right now is, is taking it from the intra-psychic part uh, into the interpersonal realm and, and qualitative can really help with that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. sure. Michael. There are more questions coming. I think one uh, by um, Jacob Eisenberg. Are you are you able to ask and unmute yourself, Jacob? There he is. Oh, hello. Um, Hi, Jacob. Yes. Hello, hello. Um, so yeah, I was just uh, jumping back from the kitchen as I heard my name. <laughs> um, so <laughs> multitasking mindfully here. So um, the question is, um, do you think that one, an academic, can effectively and uh, authentically research mindfulness without um, practicing it at least to a certain degree uh, themselves. Thanks. Sure. So just uh, I was typing some notes to make sure I capture it. So the question is is around can can an individual, you know, academic or or practitioner, you know, really teach and contribute to mindfulness without having a personal practice themselves? Teach, that, that, I was thinking about research, but yeah, I would extend it to teaching as well, yeah. You know, I, I think everyone is at a different journey spot. I think if they're interested in the topic, I hope that it's because of sort of a deeper desire to understand something. Um, and so, uh, to, to jump to the, the Cliff Notes version of the answer, I would say yes, I believe it's absolutely required that an individual have a personal practice. But the caveat there would be, I think people can become interested in mindfulness and intrigued by it. And as they learn and as they have a growth mindset around mindfulness, I believe that will lead them into deepening their practice. So I don't know if I would say it's a, you, you can't do mindfulness research without having it. I think as you continue to explore and become um, passionate about the topic, I don't see a way that you wouldn't have a personal practice. So I know I'm answering it both ways, but I think I'm hopefully leaving the door open for uh, a non-judgmental approach to how someone would you know, teach mindfulness. I think they would be always moving toward deepening that practice, but maybe they start off with it at a very intellectual level. Uh, and it's about attention, but as they go so much deeper with it, it's really about changing the way that we see ourselves and see the world and embrace more interconnection between us and how we see the world. And that leads to um, you know, a personal practice that helps us remove that ego over time uh, and, and, and the practice deepens. Thanks. Um, I'll just say that your answer sounds like a good idea for a research project. Um, the impact of teaching mindfulness on one's practice, practices and values. Thank you very much. And uh, Roger and out from Dublin. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in. And, and to, your, uh, to your point, I, I, when I teach um, undergraduate and uh, graduate and PhD courses. And, and I teach, we, we meditate at the beginning of every class uh, because I teach, you know, mindfulness is the lens through which leadership, um, that, that I teach leadership. And, and you know, I meet people at various levels and, and I let them sort of debrief what mindfulness is like and the, the different exercises and, and what thoughts they had. And um, I always joke with them because I say, you know, I've been doing this for quite a long time and, and it's a journey. We're all on a journey to becoming more in control of our thoughts and emotions and, and figuring out how do we continually reduce that 
that ego. And that means that even when I'm leading a meditation in class or when I'm playing a meditation and I'm meditating right alongside all of you, um, I still have all those thoughts. We all have those thoughts. That's what the human mind does. That's normal. So the idea of us not being good at this thing called mindfulness, no, none of us are good at it. It doesn't mean that that's not a worthwhile pursuit to continually claim our ability to, con to, to be more aware of and more intentional with our thoughts. And, and the thoughts themselves don't matter. The content is just is what it is. And, and I think the irony, and this is where I'm getting to your point, the, so many of the thoughts I have while meditating in front of my class have to do with mindfulness of like, oh, that's a really good way to put that idea. Maybe I should use that example to teach my students mindfulness. So my, um, my meta chatter is about mindfulness and, and other people's meta chatter could be about them being hungry or them, you know, thinking this is really boring, but whatever it is, we all have that, that uh, chattering mind and, and mindfulness helps us uh, be more in control of it. So thanks for that question. I, I think it's really interesting. I just popped into the chat and noticed a question that I think is really sure. relevant for both a practical, a practical um, aspect and then also the, the research side of things. So someone asked, what is the difference between meditation and mindfulness? Yeah, that's a good one. I have no answer. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that that one comes up a lot. Um, and again, it, it takes some nuance here. I think it depends on what, where people are at with their journey. Uh, I, I personally don't love the, the language around mindfulness being an umbrella term, uh, but I think there's some usefulness in that. And so sometimes I'll explain it that way. And I'll say, you know, um, if mindfulness as we define it and as we engage with it is intentional attention, right? There's lots of different ways to intentionally be attentive. And, you know, many different things will fall under that idea. And so maybe a breathing meditation is a very specific way of paying attention to our breath. So that falls under the larger uh, mindfulness idea. And people often say, you know, is, is mindfulness religious or spiritual? And, and I, of course, I talk about the roots of, of mindfulness and of meditation. But I think that the beauty in also describing it as intentional attention is that you can say, well, you know, what do so many of the religious traditions and spiritual traditions, um, how do they relate to mindfulness? Are they compatible? And usually I'll, I'll have the people have a discussion and, and what we come up with is well you know religious and spiritual traditions teach us about committing our attention in an intentional way whether that's reading a sacred text or maybe it's a prayer or maybe it's a chant it all comes down to allocating attention in an intentional way and so they would also be mindful uh they'd fit under that sort of larger category of mindfulness so it's a tricky definition but i think that's one way to um keep people curious and and keep them from pitting different ideas against each other and, and saying that like their own traditions maybe aren't in alignment with mindfulness um, and again as they go deeper and deeper it's all interconnected this is all interconnected it's really hard to say what is and what isn't um, and I think you know the way we describe it and the journey that we go on is, is we realize so much similarity and, and we actually are able to not focus so much on the differences. Um, again, that, that broadening of that interconnection is a huge piece. Thank you so much. Sure. Anything else going on in the chat? Yes, there's lots going on and I, I wanna <laughs> sort of save that chat and, and share it with everybody. Uh, I feel we're not gonna be able to get to every good question, so I apologize up front. I think, uh, German, German, are you there? I think your question sort of opens up a new new perspective here in terms of how you would move, how you currently would move from the individual to the organizational, or well, not only the organization, but organizing. Um, yeah. German, are you there and want to clarify? Yes, I'm here and just mm -hmm. want to know how you move from the individual experience into a collective 
experience first at the level of the group and then at the level of the organization so that you can have group mindfulness as you have for instance in group therapy or organizational uh, mindfulness which uh, I don't know if it really happens. Yeah, good, good question. I think there's, there's a couple of ways to answer it. There's a statistical uh, answer and there's more of a theoretical. Um, I, I guess I'll try to answer both quickly. I know we're, we're a little short on time, uh, but this idea, one way that my colleagues and I have thought about this is, is looking at a team level project, right? So you have teams working on a task and you have uh, individuals on the team, pre and post task, uh, being able to answer a questionnaire about their level of mindfulness. So really that intrapersonal level of mindfulness. And then you can have them uh, look at the end of the task, uh, what was their perception of the team's level of mindfulness. So again, this is sort of mixing that the statistical uh, with the theoretical, but that idea that, that that what emerges in a team is is an emergent property that is beyond the individual uh, components that the individuals give to the team. And so what we're seeing is that um, the neat thing here is is what emerges at the team level is distinct from the individual components and the individual components uh, that create this emergence of a team construct then go on to inform and sort of from a top down approach inform how that those team members go about the next task and so you have this sort of uh, bottom up and then top down happening um, within an unfolding team team experience. So we had students in a lab go through kind of a, a traumatic uh, scenario, like a medical scenario. And, and the first task, you know, individual team members started off at a certain level of, of mindfulness. And then they we saw what the team sort of emerged from that activity uh, with their level of mindfulness. And then we saw that, that team level of, of mindfulness then informed the starting point of the individual team members for that second task. Uh, so, so again, it's getting a little messy here and there's a lot of uh, things to, to take into account, but I think that's how you start to see both that bottom up and top down processes operating together um, over time. So thanks for that, that question. And there's a lot more work to be done in that area. And, and some people are sharing their work that relates to that. Uh, so please everyone, uh, if you're interested, check out those references. Um, there is a, another sort of bunch of questions coming up with, okay, their mindfulness may have been secularized and it's originally Buddhist, but what are your takes for universalizing it other than sort of cutting the root, uh, making it palatable to conservative Christians? I think Marty uh, is, is asking about that. How do you access maybe the the kind of business school students that are full of ego <laughs> uh, coming in uh wanting to pers persevere in the business world and i think you were mentioning that before in terms of you go where where they may be but how do you do that how do you frame it so that it doesn't lose some of its normative potentially normative uh content yeah i mean i think i'll lean a bit on on sort of the the way that i've thought through it and mentioned before it's meeting them where where they're at but it's also having the, the confidence to say I mean, this is what i do this is this is how i teach leadership and so from the very beginning um i, I always joke with my students right i, I wanted everything that i teach them about leadership i need to do in the classroom right it's it's me practicing what what i'm preaching and, and mindfulness is the exact same way so if it is a you know norm of organizations to only survey people or give them performance evaluations once a year when it matters most, that's really damaging to people being able to take the feedback and do something with it. So if a best practice is to ask for feedback or to give people feedback multiple times, 
if I'm teaching that that's a best practice, I got to do that also with my students. And so what I think that allows is me collecting feedback from students and being able to change the, the correction or to correct the course. And I think it's the same thing with, with mindfulness. If you are leading, if you can create mindfully that environment in the class, you have one of mutual respect where they can give feedback and I can give feedback and we can create something together. Uh, and the way I personally teach leadership, which may be no surprise with sort of the idea of leading without ego, and, and I certainly have an ego, we all, we all do. I think I'm, I'm hoping to reduce mine and, and all of us as, as we can, but this idea of true leadership is giving away the power Right. If you think of like hard power and soft power, yes, I have the position in the classroom as professor that has the title and has the ability to reward students with grades and punish students to some extent. Uh, but I can't rely on any of that power. That's power that I should have in my back pocket if needed, but I don't rely on it. Soft power, influence and passion and getting students to get excited about the topic. Those are the tools in my tool belt. Uh, of soft power to really get them excited and mindfulness is one of those tools so i know i'm going a bit off topic in answering the question but i think it's it's all about designing the classroom for psychological safety where people feel truly valued and feel truly connected and and it's amazing what that does to hearts and minds and and opens them up to new ways of thinking and and i can honestly say this in in teaching this for 10 years uh, in business schools. I've only taught in business schools. I've only had one student in feedback that's been given to, you know, the official course evaluation. Only one student in those 10 years say, you know, I really think that this conflicted with my religious background or, or had any kind of comment around mindfulness being negative in that way. And so I think um, doing it and setting it up and, and, and not to be cheesy, but to sort of intentionally setting up that classroom environment mindfully opens a door for conversations about mindfulness and leadership to, to take form in a different, a different way than you might be able to, to expect. I hope I answered that one. I, I was kind of all over the place, but I hope there are some good nuggets in there that, 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 that are helpful. It, that's wonderful. Every, research, teaching, practice, the, our ways of being, they're all integrated at this point and, and the infused. And so I think that your, your answer was totally relevant and very helpful. And a lot of us are in the academy and, and teaching and, and researching and in organizations. So it all works together. Um, I just wanted to give you a massive, massive thank you for joining us today. This was such a wonderful end to the week. I don't know about everyone else, but what a beautiful way to to start a Friday and um, intentionally with attention enter the weekend and potentially bring more mindfulness to our own lives. So thank you, thank you. And thank you all for being here. Um, it was a pleasure to see all your faces today. Um, you can learn more about humanistic management um, at international or humanisticmanagement.international. It's in the chat. And otherwise look out for more events we have coming up in the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend.